So we're going to talk about that and so much more of the news that matters today on today's brand new Philip DeFranco show. So buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. Starting with Elon Musk being booed for several straight minutes by a very large crowd at a Dave Chappelle show with him at one point responding by yelling, I'm rich, bitch. I'm rich, bitch! Sounds like a weird Mad Lib, but is a real thing that happened. So let's break it down. Dave Chappelle was performing at the Chase Center in San Francisco, and he brings out this special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for the richest man in the world. And to be fair, from the videos, it does seem at least in the beginning that there are varied reactions. You can hear both cheers and boos, though as it keeps going on, the booing does seem to get louder and louder, with Chappelle even commenting on the mix initially. Cheers and boos, I see. Then as the commotion continues, the boos get louder. Chappelle kind of tries to make a joke. What not expect you this, were you? We then see Chappelle kind of take a more defensive stance for Musk. Though the way he initially does it is by basically calling part of his own fan base poor. All those people are booing, and I'm just, I'm just pointing out the obvious. They have terrible seats, and I understand. <laughs> All coming from way up there. And from there, you have Chappelle, you know, cracking jokes here and there, trying to kind of win back the audience. You know, the crowd of points are laughing. Dave Chappelle's a funny dude. But then, once the laughter stops, the chorus of chaos continues. Musk even seeming at a loss as what to do. Dave, what should I say? Don't say nothing. Okay. It'll only spoil the moment. Do you hear that sound, Elon? That's the sound of pending civil unrest. With Chappelle then having to address the continuing booze. You shut the fuck up with your booze. There's something better than you can do. Booing is not the best thing you can do. Later, you had a bunch of other people hopping on stage, eventually getting Musk to quote the I'm rich bitch line from Chappelle's sketch show. You know, since these videos popped on social media, there's been a big debate around the boos versus the cheers. One person who was there said a good 80% of the stadium booed. 18,000 people and he withers like absolutely turns into a corn cob. A number of people saying, I heard Musk get booed like I've never heard before. But then you had Elon Musk with a different take, tweeting technically it was 90% cheers and 10% boos, except during quiet periods. But still, that's a lot of boos, which is a first for me in real life, frequent on Twitter. It's almost as if I've offended San Francisco's unhinged leftist. But nah. You also had a lot of people accusing Musk of trying to suppress the videos of the situation, saying that he was trying to work to prevent it from trending on Twitter. The reports even noting that a Twitter user who posted one of the first uploads of the video either got suspended or took their account down. Though, there, I do think it's worth noting that right now on Twitter, there is no shortage of videos of the incident, with Chappelle even being the number one trending topic in the US this morning. And when you go through the trending topic there, you see Chappelle himself also facing some backlash and criticism, with people saying things like begging the crowd not to boo is pretty fucking pathetic and shows how detached from reality he must be to expect any different. And Dave Chappelle whoring himself out for these uber rich white white men just to be in their presence. Literally alienating his audience, trying to force their acceptance of this colonizing right-wing asshole is so gross, I can't believe he's become this over the years. And a ton of people retweeting David Dennis Jr.'s meme of the situation. And as far as Musk, in addition to the 90%, 10% tweet that he put out, he said, the woke mind virus is either defeated or nothing else matters. But that could also be in reference to the million other reasons he's in the news right now. But hey, where I'll leave this story is, what are your thoughts on this mess of a situation? Regarding Musk, Chappelle, that audience, any and all thoughts, I'd love to hear from you in those comments. And then, do you have a workplace ick? You know, something your boss, a coworker, or a client does that just makes your skin crawl or like sets your teeth on edge. And more importantly, if you have one or several, is it something that you would feel comfortable sharing with the entirety of the internet, including the people you're talking about and or the company that you work for? And the reason I ask is because there was a group of people out there that did. And specifically, it was a group of nurses from a labor and delivery department at a hospital in Georgia that jumped on the ick trend, with them in this video sharing their icks about patients and family members in their department. My ick is when you come in for your induction, talking about, can I take a shower and eat? What? My ick is when you ask me how much the baby weighs and it's still and it's still in your hands. <laughs> Dad comes outside and asks for a paternity test right outside the room door. Saying you don't want any pain medicine, no epidural, but you are at an eight out of 10 pain just to serve a deal and you're still closed, fingertip. Well, we've already told you to push the call light, but every five minutes, excuse your family me, member coming at the front desk, asking for something else. Excuse me, can I have a blanket? Another egg. When you're going room to room between one baby mama and your other baby mama. Oh, no. Egg. <laughs> Say that. It's the unlimited trips to the nurse's station for me. So 
As you can imagine, the original video is deleted, but of course the internet is forever, so it's been circulating on TikTok and other platforms. And the comment sections have not been friendly to these nurses, saying things like, my ick is unethical professionals, and my ick is when nurses are heartless during the happiest time of a family's and or woman's life. This is so disheartening. And it appears that Emory Healthcare, who owns the hospital, felt the same way, because they ended up posting a statement online calling the TikTok disrespectful and unprofessional, and referring to these people by their new job title, former employees. So it's currently not clear whether they were fired or left on their own accord. But also, I do want to note, it's not just one-sided. We saw a number of people coming to the defense of the nurses, saying, I'm not a nurse, but why aren't they allowed to complain about their job like everyone else does? And these people save lives all day. Of course, they're going to have icks. As long as they get the job done right, it shouldn't be a problem. And so that's why I want to leave you with two questions. One, which camp do you land in? What's your opinion regarding these nurses? And two, if you're interested in threatening your job security, what are your biggest workplace icks? Personally, I would advise you not to answer that second question. I don't think it's a good idea to shit where you eat. But since when did any of you beautiful bastards act actually take my advice on anything. And then, this may be the worst school district in the United States of America. Or you might think yours is bad, but hear me out first. So for this news, we have to go to the great state of Florida, specifically Brevard County, where the school board just had to hold a special meeting to address an exodus of faculty and staff from the district. With more than 50 teachers and bus drivers reportedly quitting their jobs in the past two years, many of them recently, and most because of the same problem, student behavior. And looking into this, you have endless complaints of violence, theft, drug abuse, even sexual activity. And in fact, it got so bad that the county had to expel or suspend at least 7,400 students and arrested 94 during the 2020-21 school year. And so at the board meeting, you had the staff detailing the horrors they had to endure every day. On an everyday basis, I'm deflecting, being attacked, um, scratched, um, headbutted. I've been spit on, spit in the face. Student attacked three teachers today. Incident six, a kid bit her on Friday. The bite mark on her arm is the size of an orange. At times, we have to call someone to come to our room so that we can go have a little mini breakdown. And these testimonies go on and on. You've got teachers saying the kids have pulled their hair, even gone for their throat. And so as far as what to do about this, some argued that disruptive students should be removed from the classroom. Others even suggesting that parents should attend class with their kids. We also had one idea coming from outside the meeting the week prior, when you had Sheriff Wayne Ivey saying, They know nothing's going to happen to them. They know they're not going to be uh, given after-school detention. They're not going to be suspended. They're not going to be expelled. Or like in the old day they're not going to have the cheeks of their ass torn off if you're a little snot that's coming to our classes to be disruptive you might want to find someplace else to go to school because we're going to be your worst nightmare starting right now and so naturally you had that statement hanging over the board meeting and there you saw people pushing back against the sheriff's approach saying that more discipline and policing isn't the solution arguing instead what you really need is better mental health support and classroom management with the south brevard naacp and some board members pointing out that students of color and those with disabilities are disproportionately punished and ultimately the meeting ended with few specific policies but district leaders were directed to resurrect a committee charged with improving the school discipline plan. And so with this absolute mess, I want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? And then we had more bad ticket master news with this latest situation happening in Mexico on Friday, where hundreds of fans were denied entry to one of the last shows of Bad Bunny's tour. And as far as what, how, and why, Ticketmaster Mexico released a statement explaining that an unprecedented number of people were sold fake tickets and saying this caused an unusual overcrowding in the intermittent operation of our system, which generated confusion and complicated entrance to the stadium with the unfortunate consequence that some legitimate tickets were denied entry and adding that fans who had legitimate tickets will be refunded. But that's not where the trouble ends for them because the situation caught the attention of officials in Mexico, this including the attention of Ricardo Sheffield, Mexico's federal consumer attorney, who notably tweeted that his office is requesting a report from Ticketmaster about the ticket access to the concert. And on top of that, the office of the federal prosecutor for the consumer will require Ticketmaster's reimbursement to include extra compensation worth 20% of the ticket's cost. As well as Sheffield saying the Ticketmaster will have to pay a fine worth 10% of its 2021 earnings. And Sheffield also later arguing on a radio show that the tickets weren't false as the company claimed, instead stating that Ticketmaster was the one that actually issued those tickets. Though, as of recording, Ticketmaster has not issued any further statement on the situation. But also, this all notably happening after the Taylor Swift era's tour controversy. With that dominating headlines in November, you have the U.S. Justice Department now investigating its parent company, Live Nation, over antitrust concerns. Taylor Swift fans accusing the company of fraud, price fixing, and antitrust violations, and claiming that this intentional deception led to resellers getting the bulk of the tickets. So bad news left and right for them, but really the only way that this is going to change is if they get penalized to an extreme degree. And as of recording, it remains to be seen if that will actually
actually happen. And then, I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's show, Squarespace. You know, I've been partnering with Squarespace for years now, and I have to say, if you're getting your business off the ground or creating a place to share your homemade goods, your new favorite hobby, your current obsession, or even just have a personal blog to get all those thoughts out of your head, no matter what you're doing, Squarespace is there to help. And it's all so easy. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It's extremely intuitive and easy to use. And with their mobile optimized websites, your content automatically adjusts so it looks great on any device. Plus, with Squarespace, you get access to all their marketing tools and analytics and their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat 24-7. So if you want to check it out, see why so many others love it, see if it's right for you, start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash Phil. And when you realize you love it, make sure you enter an offer code Phil to get 10% off your first purchase. And then, what better way to show off your Christmas cheer than a good old-fashioned fist fight. Christmas in LA, baby. Specifically, this starts Friday evening at Lincoln Park in Los Angeles. Because that's where more than 100 parents and children gathered for the tree lighting celebration. You got kids dancing in pink tutus, playing in a snow pit outside, even a DJ playing holiday songs. It's a fun holiday event, at least uh, until this happens. But so those are protesters calling for the resignation of city council member Kevin DeLeon. And while he was there in a Santa hat handing out presents to children, if you don't remember, he was also one of the three council members, including the council president, who was on a leaked recording that sparked outrage last October for being racist. Or that was when you had one of the people there saying their black colleague handled his son like an accessory and compared the boy to a monkey. And DeLeon specifically saying the man handles his son like a Louis Vuitton bag. And while the other participants in that recording have stepped down, DeLeon is the only one who's still in office. And there have been protests outside his home for months now. And so on this day, after the protest, protesters show up, they chase him around the auditorium for several minutes, calling him racist. Meanwhile, you have families watching the spectacle, and eventually the protesters corner him in a back room, and what happens next is disputed. What we do know is that De Leon engaged in a physical altercation with an activist by the name of Jason Reedy, and both sides have since claimed that the other battered them, but you can see the pair standing nose to nose in this video, at which point De Leon claims that Reedy thrusted his pelvis into him and then headbutted him. Though it's not clear whether their heads connected, and if so, whether it was intentional. But, I mean, whoever started it, you can see De Leon shove Reedy into a table and push him down a hallway with Reedy punching him at least once. And so what we're seeing in the wake of all of this are very polarized reactions. You have some saying, hey, you can protest, but don't ruin this community event for a low-income neighborhood. But then you've got activists arguing they have to do this because normal channels of public comment and protests haven't produced any results. And as for the other city council members, some condemned the activists, with one even calling the incident terrorism. But at the same time, you had others taking the opportunity to reiterate demands that De Leon stepped down. Though as of recording this, he has not and continues to refuse to do so. Now as far as the physical altercation, you have the police investigating, though nobody's been taken into custody right now. So we're gonna have to wait to see what happens happens there, but actually looking into this, this is not the first time these two have gotten physical, right? Reedy's actually been protesting De Leon for months now, and back in March when he was filming him, the councilman reached to block the camera, allegedly hitting him in the face. And then at another event, Reedy was taping him, and again, De Leon reportedly pushed one activist and grabbed the cell phone from another. So that's where we are, we'll have to see what happens next, but uh, for everyone else outside of LA, uh, I hope this has been a just introduction to the garbage fire that is Los Angeles politics. And then, fentanyl is the leading cause of death for Americans 18 to 49. It's 50 times more potent than heroin, 100 times more than morphine. It was also reportedly responsible for the two-thirds of the over 100,000 drug overdose deaths in America last year, and the number of Americans killed by fentanyl has increased by 94% since 2019. And so while there are a number of questions, one of them is how the hell did we get here? And regarding that, you actually had the Washington Post doing a seven-part investigation into the fentanyl crisis in America. And there, they found that multiple U.S. administrations and the organizations beneath them fumbled in their response to the epidemic. With this tragedy beginning as far back as the Bush administration, when you had countless Americans becoming addicted to prescription opioids like oxycodone. And then, in the Obama era, the head of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, the drug czar was demoted and the role was removed from cabinet, and the government dismantled and defunded drug monitoring programs in the years before the fentanyl surge. And then, you had Trump take office. And on the precipice of this epidemic, he promised that his border wall would stop drugs from entering the country. But in actuality, most traffickers were and are bringing it through checkpoints, hiding it in passenger vehicles or commercial trucks, with that then bringing us to the Biden administration, which, yeah, has boosted the public messaging campaign about the dangers of fentanyl and stepped up efforts to scan for the drug at border crossings, but neither he nor his top officials have said much about the staggering amount that is still making its way into the country. And according to the Post's investigation, the most reliable gauge of the supply of fentanyl entering the country is the amount seized at the Mexican border. And they found that since July, officials have seized an average of 2,200 pounds per month. And the thing is, they are estimating they are only stopping between 5 and 10% of the fentanyl entering the country. And honestly, it could be even less than that, even with the number of seized tablets of fentanyl being projected to reach over 35 million. But understand, it's not just the presidential administrations that are dropping the ball. The DEA 
DEA was found to be slow in their response as Mexican cartels took over the market from Chinese producers, without allowing them to make a massive illicit pharmaceutical market making more fentanyl than ever before. And the DEA has even acknowledged that the government was too fixated on heroin as the fentanyl crisis began. And Homeland Security, you know, the department responsible for finding illegal drugs coming through the borders, they channeled their funding to a border wall rather than technology to improve scanning at checkpoints. And understand, all of this is on top of the struggle to track fentanyl in real time, where the CDC is publishing its data a year behind and it's still counting the death toll from last year, as well as the Department of Health and Human Services, which has not tracked the rise of fentanyl and doesn't know how many Americans are currently using it. With John P. Walters, the drug czar under Clinton and Bush saying, this is like tracking the epidemic by visiting cemeteries. We're not measuring what's coming into the country in real time. We're not measuring what's happening with the health consequences and where to put resources to buffer those health consequences. Our drug control strategy is an embarrassment and it doesn't begin to propose a way of reversing this problem. And one of the interesting things here is that there is actually a system that collects fatal and non-fatal overdose data in parts of the country in real time, but it's actually kept from public view. But also with this story, and like I do pretty much with everything we talk about, I'm going to link to this down below. But with his post-investigation specifically, right, it details some heartbreaking stories about the victims of fentanyl and those of on-the-ground narcotics agents and their experiences, as well as, I mean, some deeper dives into the top-level stuff that we're covering here. But in the meantime, let me know your thoughts on this topic, but also maybe if you have experiences, whether it be lived or, or seen. And then Trump was dealt another meaningful blow this morning. This after a federal judge officially dismissed his lawsuit trying to prevent the government's access to the documents seized from Mar-a-Lago that he improperly kept. And this is absolutely massive because it officially marks the end of Trump's months-long legal fight following the FBI's raid of his home. But as we've talked about before, Trump and his team requested a special master to review the documents seized at Mar-a-Lago and block the DOJ from accessing them during that time. And back in September, U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, granted his request for a special master in a highly unusual move that was widely condemned by legal experts. With Cannon's decision then being struck down earlier this month by an appeals court panel of three judges who very significantly were all appointed by Republicans and two of which were actually appointed by Trump himself. And those judges wrote a scathing opinion overturning Cannon's initial decision. And then last week after Trump failed to appeal to the Supreme Court, the panel officially brought an end to the special master's review and lifted the injunction that had blocked federal prosecutors from accessing the Mar-a-Lago documents. With all that then prompting Cannon's decision to toss a lawsuit today and saying she did so because of a lack of jurisdiction. And so now, after all of that, the Justice Department can finally continue its review after nearly three months of legal back and forth. And the timing is also very significant here because it comes just a few days after more classified documents were reportedly found at Trump's properties, with sources telling reporters that a team hired by Trump's lawyers to search for classified materials recently found at least two additional documents at a storage unit in Florida. Now, as far as the contents of those documents, that remains unclear right now, but the sources say that they were immediately turned over to the FBI. But at the very least, uh, those additional documents just further highlight the concerns that Trump and his team didn't fully comply with a subpoena issued by a federal judge back in May, demanding that he return all classified documents that he had taken from the White House. And of course, this added fuel to the ongoing speculations that Trump still hasn't returned all the documents and that he may have kept some at other locations besides Mar-a-Lago. In fact, according to reports shortly after that news broke, the DOJ asked a federal judge to hold Trump's team in contempt for failing to comply with the May subpoena. Though, you had people familiar with the matter there telling reporters that the judge ended a hearing on the matter this Friday without acting on the DOJ request, allegedly saying that it was up to the department and Trump's team to address concerns about whether he might still have more classified materials at his properties. And so for now, we have to wait and see uh, what will come from all of this. But that is where that story in today's show ends. If you're new here, make sure you hit that subscribe button, join the DeFranco Nation. And for the rest of you beautiful bastards, thanks for tuning in once again for your daily dive into the news with this uh, this idiot. <laughs> of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.